Okay, so welcome to a discussion on how to properly answer a problem-based uh, question. And this uh, discussion we are doing applies to all type of uh, problem-based uh, questions. Now, this particular session is informed by observation uh, made uh, by you know, people uh, who examine students and who have been involved in uh, various types of uh, assessments, uh, both at the LLB level and also those involved in the entrance examination, as well as even the uh, professional uh, examination. And one consistent concern is that a good number of students uh, do not properly uh, know how to answer a problem-based question. So I'd like you to pay attention to what we are going to do, because as I always say, uh, the presentation of your answer is as good as the, the merit of the answer. In other words, it is not enough it is not enough for you to uh, actually um, have the, the correct uh, response to the particular merits being uh, tested. But more uh, importantly, uh, you should be able to present your answer in a manner which is consistent with the established you know, approach of responding to uh, problem-based questions in law. And that is why uh, a student may be good. He or she writes examination and he or she does not get the marks which should reflect the level of his knowledge because uh, he or she chose to use the knowledge that he or she has to answer the question in the way and the manner that he or she uh, considers appropriate in defiance of established protocol, established approach, answering a problem-based uh, question. So therefore, uh, I'm going to share my screen and then uh, walk you through what I think you should pay attention to. And as I said, this applies to not only a particular area of law, any area of the law where uh, you are actually uh, required to address the problem based uh, question, you can. Uh, use uh, this approach and it will let your answer uh, attract the needed uh, credits and the attention. Now, apart from uh, you, uh, for example, doing uh, what is usually done uh, when it comes to you know how uh, problem questions are resolved in law, uh, if you heeded what we are discussing, you would uh, also actually be uh, attracting the eye of the examiner. What do I mean by that? Your examiner has got so many uh, you know, scripts to deal with. And for that matter, you shouldn't let your examiners, your markers struggle in trying to persuade it as whether you know uh, what is being uh, tested. So let us uh, keep that in mind. It's very uh, important. Okay, so uh, having said that, uh, all of us uh, from the very first day we started learning law in the various law faculties, we know what you call the problem-based question. Now the problem-based question is actually 
uh, in line with what lawyers do, what judges do. So you are given a scenario or hypothetical set of facts, and you must assume that they are undisputed. Let me say this again. Within the context of examination, okay, you don't have the opportunity to actually uh, take evidence. You are not, if you like, the, a, a real life trial judge sitting there uh, taking evidence of uh, witnesses so that you are able to establish whether uh, what A is saying is the truth and so on and so forth. Therefore, as far as the given facts are concerned, you must assume them to be undisputed. That is to say that take them as what is there. It doesn't matter whether you believe they are true or they are not true, that is not important. And the other point is that don't read in facts which are not part of the first giving. Don't import facts. So these are the preliminary remarks before we start uh, analyzing the Iraq ISF. So don't import uh, facts. If you do that, uh, it's like you are setting your own question. So let's keep that in mind. It is different where you are doing the application or the analysis and you are doing maybe like a logical inference. If you are maybe like, you are giving a certain fact and then you are trying to reason out of that. You are making certain extrapolations, certain inferences. That way you are not necessarily uh, uh, you know, adding facts to what you have given. And uh, this IRAC uh, is a well-known method in all law schools, go to the US, uh, they usually talk about the Iraq, although some UK schools don't talk about the Iraq, except that uh, instead of Iraq, some will say IPAC, uh, where the I stand for issue, the R uh, rules or the relevant law, and then the A application, or some will say application through analysis, and then the conclusion. And then the P, which is used in some other uh, schools, is principle, but it's, it, it plays the same function as the rule. So it is, that is not really important. But what is important for us to remember is that uh, the IRAC or the IPAC is the required framework for organizing your response to problem-based question. What that means is that if you have a question, whether in the law faculties or in the law school entrance examination or whatever, and it's a problem-based question. And for example, you decide to just produce your running narrative without using the framework of the IRAC. What it means is that your response to that problem question is not structured according to the accepted traditions of dealing with problem questions. And you have you suffer dearly for that because uh, you lose out some of the marks uh, which you are supposed to do. Why do I say that? Usually in the marking scheme for problem-based question, uh, the questions, you no, know, the marks may be distributed across the IRAC framework. And where you are, for example, ignore the IRAC framework and just put just the ideas there, uh, the, you may, just get what you call like the global award of marks. Uh, the examiner will just read through and then just globally put the marks there. And he or she may not have to do the breakdown. And so that each segment of your answer is uh, rewarded according to what the marking scheme says. And that way you'll be able to accumulate as many marks as possible. Yeah, so that is another advantage of uh, uh, no, that's another advantage of actually sticking to the Iraq in solving uh, a problem-based uh, question. So let's keep that uh, in mind. 
But let me emphasize that that's why the fact that the, the popular way of saying it is Iraq, beginning with I, it is also it is also permissible for you to have an A. So that is like Iraq. So therefore, uh, for some people, uh, they may, for example, uh, talk about area of law, okay? So in that case, you have A uh, coming before the I. Yeah, so that is uh, the, the, the other uh, variation, but uh, having uh, said that, uh, we need to go systematic. So if you are using the IRAC, the introduction of your answer will do two things, and only two things, especially if you are those accustomed to using the A, that is the IRAC. In, in any case, if you use the, the, the A, you don't lose anything. So I will even uh, suggest that, uh, especially those of you who are preparing to write the entrance examination, I will even suggest that uh, you are you can say you can use the A so that we have that the A rack. The, and then the, so the introduction, you are going to state the area or areas of law, right? The area or areas of law. I said area or areas in the sense that it is possible to have more than one uh, area uh, of law. And then uh, the other thing you are doing introduction is identification of the issues. So the introduction of your answer to problem-based question, uh, you state the area or areas of law, and then you identify the issues. We are going to take them one after the other. So uh, in your introduction, that is not where you are going to give an exposition of uh, concepts and principles. No, that, this is not an essay question. This is uh, responding to a problem-based question. And that is, uh, is different from where you are invited to just do, uh, if you like, uh, 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 you know, an essay. An essay, we know that the introduction will do a number of things, but in a problem-based question, within the uh, the established tradition of you know, law and then you know, judicial reasoning, legal reasoning, and all that, you just do the need for. You map out the area or areas of law, and then two, you identify or generate the issues, okay? So now let us start, uh, uh, let's, let's look into that the era of law. So the era of law you are supposed to do as part of the introduction uh, simply means that you are to be specific, right? About the area where the legal issues or liabilities are arising from. And not era of law per se. If I say not era of law per se, that is to say that, uh, we are not saying that state the area of law is contract, the area of law is tort or criminal law. No, although uh, in a law school entry examination, because you are writing a composite paper, composite paper in the sense that uh, say subjects uh, being examined uh, in one paper, one would have expected that uh, the area of law, if you indicated the subject area, it will not be out of place. Nevertheless. Uh, there seem not to be consensus among uh, examiners, and for that matter, I would suggest that let us do the traditional thing. The traditional thing is that the area of law is not really about sitting like the subject, right? But it's about the specific area within, if you like, the subject area where the issues or the liabilities are arising from. So, for example, uh, the area of law applicable to the liabilities or legal issues in this question is uh, privity of contract, right? Privity of contract. And I put into bracket that not law of contract. So you don't say that the area of law is a law of contract, no. Uh, privity of contract. Or 
occupies liability, not law of thoughts. So we didn't say that the area of law is what? Is law uh, of thought. So let's pay attention. The area of law, you are becoming specific regarding the particular, if we like, the topic areas, right? Within the, the law field, relevant to the issues that you are going to, under which you are going to raise the issues. And that is why I said that the area of law applicable to the legal issues for example, a spirit of contract or misrepresentation and not uh, law of contract or occupies liability and not law of thought or uh, let's say murder, right? Murder uh, and, and, and manslaughter and not criminal law, right? Yeah, so let's keep that in mind. And then we come to the issue or uh, the issue. So the issue uh we are referring to legal issue let me put it that way the reason is that this is a school scenario or examination scenario is not real life where uh you know as lawyers as judges uh and of course you know uh in ghana legal system and legal method when we discuss the uh, an overview of the civil procedure we talk about pleadings, right? Statement of uh, claim, statement of defense, uh, reply, and all that. And we noted that pleadings are supposed to narrow the, you know, the, the, the factual allegations and all that between the parties. Now, during the trial, evidence will be taken as whether something happened or did not happen. But that does not apply to school scenario. It does not apply to resolving problem-based question in examination. And that means that in examination setting, if we talk about issue, you are referring to legal issue. You are not referring to factual issue. In real life, issue does not refer to only legal issue. Because when you are doing, or do, you know, if you do litigation or if you are doing trial, there could be an issue as to whether a certain uh, a, a, a fact whether something happened or did not happen, which is a factual thing, and that is not necessarily like legal, right? But in examination setting, as I said, when we talk about issue, our attention should be on the legal issue. That is a legal question, right? Uh, legal question, uh, which is uh, in dispute between the, 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 the parties. So let us keep that in mind. So I'll be surprised if, instead of formulating an issue, you, for example, formulated an issue as to whether or not A actually shot at B. I mean, that is, assuming you are doing something relation, let's say criminal law or murder or manslaughter or causing unlawful harm, and for example, you did something like that, uh, you do not have the, what it takes to be able to answer that because you are not going to take evidence. The information you have is what has been provided in the question. And that is why you don't have to uh, think about factual issue, but only uh, legal issue. When we talk about the identification of the issue. Now, when we are done with all this, I'm going to show you a sample of the uh, answer layout and how uh, you can let your answer uh, appear so that uh, it will receive the necessary respect by your examiners or your markets uh, as uh, it were. Yeah, so uh, just to uh, recap, I've said that in problem-based question, the issue is issue of law and not issue of fact, which will have to be settled by evidence, but you don't have the evidence. So it's just about issue of law. So you start your uh answer by identifying all legal matters matters or likely to be disputed so for example uh <clears throat> if uh there's a question about a contra dispute it will not going to require you to discuss everything about contract so you need to for example find out uh which particular aspect of 
contract law, you know, based upon the story that you have read, right? Uh, which are going to uh, be distributed by the parties so that party A may say that, party B may argue that. Yeah, so the identification of the issue, as I've indicated, is what makes up the introduction to your answer. I only added the, 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 the other uh, concession that in Ghana, uh, a good number of us are used to adding area of law. And that is why I said that there is nothing wrong if in the introduction you add the area of law. So we just say the area of law, but I just question that the area of law should be like the topic under which the issues are arising from. And immediately after that, you add the issues. And the issues are the legal uh, questions uh, as it were. So let us keep uh, that in mind. So, uh, for example, the issue, uh, let me just run to a sample I have uh, down there and then we come back so that you have uh, I have, go. So I have like a two uh, sample, right? So one sample, the student just started with an issue and said that so he has introduction. That is the beginning of the answer. The issues going to be discussed as follows. Then the person you know, just stated one, whether or not bill is limited, a building 50 foot tower constitute a breach of contract, whether or not vital uh, statistics entitled to reinstatements, uh, cost diminishing in value or loss of amenity, and so on and so forth. So this is uh, one introduction. Then uh, the other sample I have, uh, which also makes use of the, uh, the, the A, that is the IRAC. So, Look at this one, for example, this is the second sample out of the answer using the A, that is the Iraq. So here the person said like the, the areas of law, my issues are centered on are negligent misrepresentation, remedies which are rescission of, con uh, of contract and damages, uh, you know, loss of amenity, fundamental breach, and this effect on exemption clause. The issues that can be raised are, so here you see that the person started with like the statement of the area of laws and then the person followed up with the issues. Yeah, so either of these approaches are correct. But as I said, uh, because you are not sure of uh, the preference of the a particular examiner, so better use the Iraq, right? So that you are within. If the area of law is being given max, you get the mass uh, meant for that. On the other hand, if it's not being given max and you've been provided it, you don't lose anything. So I think it's better to add the area of law, the areas of law, uh, so that if that is attracting max in the marking scheme, you are able to uh, get that. So let us keep that in mind. So uh, the issue, for example, I gave, uh, illustration like this. The issue should always be in a question form. If I say in a question form, of course, over here, uh, a lot of us are used to saying that whether or not uh, Dane's poster was an invitation to treat. But it doesn't have to be know that or not. So long as it's in a question form, uh, that is an issue. So was Jane's poster an offer or invitation to treat? or differently put, whether Jane's poster was an offer. Yeah, but the, the, the most important thing as I've indicated is that the issue should always come out as a question, right? So let us look at the, the, the example, of course, when we finish, we look at the, 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 the sample answers. Yeah, but what you should remember is that the issue should always come out as question or questions. And if you have more than one, uh, you can number them and so on, or say first, second, third, and fourth. So that is fine. Now, when you, uh, you also have you know, what you call like the, the rule, that is the, now you finish, let's say you finish outlining all the issues in the introduction, okay? Now you are going to do 
the treatment of each of the issues. And this is uh, what is really important to me. Take the issue, you know, there is this tendency among some students or even some uh, lecturers to let the student list all the issues in the introduction. And then after that, they should state all the law together in one you know, lengthy narration. And then they leave that and come and do one combined application analysis. I don't recommend such an approach, especially for uh, students who are writing for good marks. The reason being that that approach uh, is risky. Risky in the sense of uh, you, you jam up a lot of things together and then when you are doing the application and analysis, there is the danger that you may gloss over certain aspects of the issues or they may not come out clearly. And that is why I would suggest that in the introduction, when you've done the area of law and then the issues, then you come to take the issue one after the other, right? So you take uh, the first issue, don't just write issue one, actually restate the issue, like state the issue as it is, okay? For example, you take it, uh, was Jane's poster an offer invitation to treat? That is, you make it like a heading. There's even nothing wrong if you even underline it so that it stands out or you write it, if you like, uh, in, in, in caps, in capital, so that it stands out that, uh, and everybody knows that this is the issue that you are discussing. Now, immediately after that, you are supposed to state the rule or the rules under that issue. And here, let me say that you don't have to write the word rule, right? <laughs> you don't need to write the word rule before we start setting the rule, it's not really important. Uh, so in setting the rule or the principle of law relevant to the issue that you are dealing with, you start with the, the general rule, okay? And if there are exceptions to that rule, you state the exceptions as well. But we must remember that the rule or the law must always be stated in the command style. In the command style, in the sense that it is a, that is the position of the law which you are stating. It's not your own opinion or your wish. You are just stating the law. That is why it should be in the command style, for example. So let's say that uh, you are using uh, the James example. So we may say that the advertisement shelf displays and shop window displays are generally an invitation to treat and not an offer capable of acceptance. So that is a command way of stating the rule or the, the relevant proposition. And in setting the rule, you, you say it in a command style in the form of like a proposition, but it must be accompanied by the authority. If I say authority, if the proposition of law you are stating emanate from, let's say, a constitutional provision, right? Emanates from a constitutional provision. So let's suppose that uh, you have, uh, let's say, a question, uh, let's say, relating to maybe uh, human rights or or something like that. And let's suppose that that particular uh, human right has to do with the uh, maybe unlawful arrest, right? Unlawful arrest or something like that. And you are setting the, the, the relevant law under that particular issue. You say that a person arrested shall be uh, informed immediately the language that he understands, uh, the reason for his arrest, and then uh, his right to a lawyer of his choice. So you stated this in a proposition form, then immediately you have to state uh, Article 14, Clause 2. 
1992 constitution. So that is what we mean. On the other hand, where you are not, uh, the, the proposition is not emanating from the constitution or a legislation, but it's like the, a case law, right? It's like a, from a decision of the, of the, of, of, of the court, just like here. Uh, then you cite that particular authority. So if you look at what we have here, we said that advertisement, shelf displays and shelf window displays are general invitation to treat and not an offer. People of acceptance. And we make colon, Fisher and Bell. Of course, forget about the citation. Okay, that is the 1961 1KB394. In examination setting, nobody expects to, to no citation. So it is actually uh, a waste of time and also useless to worry your head about keeping citation of authorities uh, in mind for purposes of examination. If you are doing uh, coursework or homework, it's a different matter. That one, you have access to your library and all that. So we expect you to provide citation, but in examination setting, only the title, Fisher and Bell. Or let's suppose that you have forgotten the full case, but you, you remember the proposition that I've stated and you remember only Fisher. You don't remember Bell. You can say, the, uh, you can say uh, that Fisher case, right? So once the proposition is correct, your examiner knows the Fisher case. You will know that you probably forgotten like the, the other side of the authority. Now, we have indicated that, we have indicated that where you state the, the rule and there's an exception, the exception should be added. So here, uh, if you look at it, uh, we have stated the exception. You know, we stated like the first part of the rule, advertisement, share displays, and shop windows displays are general invitation to treat and not an offer capable of acceptance. So that is the general part of the rule. We have the authority there. Then we follow it up with the exception. However, if the circumstances are such that it seems genuinely to be an offer to the world, and all that is required is some act on behalf of the offeree in order to meet the terms of the offer, then it may amount to an actual offer. So you see that we have followed the general rule, the general principle with the relevant exception. And you must also provide the authority. So we make column, call against Kabbalist smoke ball. So that is how we are supposed to state the rules under the particular issue you are dealing with, okay? So you state uh, the rules under the particular issue you are dealing with in this particular fashion. Now, when you are done with that, you come to application of the legal rules or the principle. And this is uh, really the crux of the matter because this is where uh, you are going to apply the facts of your hypothetical case, okay, to uh, the law which you have stated and then answer the issue. Because we've noted that the issue is a question. So let's give that in mind. So for example, uh, we we'll just give this example and then we we'll go into the breakdown of what application actually entails, right? So like the example that we have, like uh, you are doing the application. It could, for example, go like this. Jane's poster is similar in effect to the display of flake knives in Fisher and Bell, to the advertisement in Partridge and Crichton. Because as in that case, Jane's poster advertises something for which there is a limited supply so that she cannot have meant to be bound by acceptances from an unlimited number of people. Now, if you look at this uh, short illustration, you notice that we are using aspects of the facts based upon the law that we have stated to find out whether the particular issue that we raised regarding the poster being of invitation to treat, how it should be answered. And 
if you look at it, uh, we have really achieved what is required. So let us application of uh, law to the issues. Uh, we can say three, time, three things are involved, right? It consists of three things. So one, identification and extraction of relevant facts. So when you, you, we come to the application of the rules or the principle uh, under the issue that you are dealing with, I think three main things, if you like, uh, are involved. You identifying and extracting the relevant facts from the question in the light of the, that particular issue that you are dealing with, okay? And then you apply the law to the facts in the question. You apply the law to the facts in the question. Uh, and then you support the application with case law or judicial reasoning. So let's take each of these uh, three segments under application of the relevant uh, rules or law one after the other. So identification extraction of relevant facts. Let's take this illustration, right? You could put it this way, that it is evident from the fact that Mr. Law ate the apple without Mr. Ezam's consent or uh, the first suggest that Mr. Law ate the apple belonging to Mr. Law without his consent. So here, you see that under that particular issue, we have extracted, right? We have zoomed in on the relevant portion of the facts to that particular issue. Now we are now going to uh, you know, merge the facts with the law. That is to say that, we want to marry the law identified. That is the rule that you have stated, okay? With the extracted facts. Now you've stated the law. You have also extracted the relevant portion of the facts under you know, that issue. Now you need to show uh, how the fact, for example, satisfy the requirements of the law or the facts we have do not satisfy the requirement of the law, as it were. And you could, for example, illustrate it this way. A court is likely to find that Mr. Law's failure to obtain the consent of Mr. Ezams before eating the apple breach session 17 of the Mental Health at 22. We just citing that as an example. It can be anything. It can be criminal law, it can be taught, it can be contract constitutional law or anything, which imposes a duty not to eat an apple without the consent of the owner. Now let's pay attention to why we said that a court is likely to find, okay? If we say that a court is likely to find that maybe a certain aspect of the facts, okay, satisfy the principle of law that you have stated, what that means is that we are going to follow that up with a case law to support the application. Now you are saying that you know a particular case law, which is very similar to what we are talking about. Now students will ask the question, uh, when we cite the case law in solving problem-based question, are we supposed to state all that you know about that case or what? Okay, this is my answer to such a question in case you had that in mind. When we are doing problem-based question, the case law or the relevant cases may be cited in two ways. The first one is when you are doing the statement of the rules or the statement of the principles under the particular issue. And we have stated that you are required to state it in proposition form, in a command form, and immediately follow it up with the source of that. And the source, if it's the case, you put it there. Just the title at that stage. You are not required to tell us what happened in that case at that at that particular, uh, 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 you know, at that particular stage. So let's keep that uh, in mind. Now the second stage, in which uh, students will have to use 
cases in which student will have to use cases it actually resolving a uh, problem based question is this particular stage when it gets to like the application stage okay when we have extracted the relevant aspect of the facts in relation to the you know the issue and then you need to show that whether the the relevant rule that you stated whether is met whether is satisfied by the facts that you have extracted and that uh, the court will for example agree with the particular conclusion that you want to draw on that if there is a case in which a similar thing you know happened and then the court uh made a particular holding a particular conclusion then when you introduce it at this stage you are supposed to tell us briefly what happened in that case and then uh, what the court actually uh, held that way you have used that to buttress the kind of uh, application the kind of analysis or the kind of argument uh, which you are making in respect of that okay so let's uh, keep that uh, in mind so and when you are doing it you know it can be like this for example in the case of i mean law and exams it's just a hypothetical uh, it's not it's not true it's just like a made up right let's say that in the case of law against exams the court held that failure to obtain the cons donor's consent before eating an apple breach section 72 of the mental health mental health act 2020 2012 so here you notice that we have just given just a brief information about you know the case and then what the court uh, held so that is how it is done now after this you are now going to conclude on the issue because you haven't concluded on the issue you still have the question to answer okay the issue that you have said what is your answer your answer is going to be formed by uh, what you've done so far so we are going to draw the initial conclusion. Uh, when uh, you have done that, if there is any defense, so let's say that uh, you have uh, concluded on the issue that you raised, but then you are also uh, aware of certain uh, possible defense in the law. You don't have to ignore that because when it comes to uh, law, we don't have only one side, right? To every legal situation, there are two sides. So just as you are making a claim or just as you are trying to show that a certain uh, course of action exists, the person against whom you are trying to say that you have a course of action against him or her may also bring up a certain defense, which is also recognized in law that despite this, I cannot be held liable because of S, Y, Z. For that matter, if you want your answer to be A plus answer, that is an answer which is going to get like the, a very a high max. Then if there is, for example, a defense uh, by the other party against whom uh, you have presently demonstrated that there is a liability or cause of action, then you may need to also uh, you know, consider uh, that defense. Or if you introduce that defense and you think that maybe due to a particular aspect you have in the, in the fact, that defense may not uh, properly avail that party, then you need to uh, also uh, do that. Okay, so uh, for example, we said that uh, based on the interpretation, this is just hypothetical illustration, based on the interpretation of judicial reason, in the case law against exams, okay, Mr. Law is liable unless you can raise some defenses. Yeah, so that is like the initial, you know, the initial conclusion that you have drawn. And you're also saying that unless you can raise some defenses. So if you think that uh, there are some potential defenses available to the other party. Then 
uh, you raise uh, those potential uh, defenses. That way, your answer will stand out against uh, other uh, students. So if you want to get the high marks, then you have to be structured in your response to the uh, problem-based question. Now, all that you have done, they come under dealing with only one issue. So when you finish, you move to another issue. You know, the introduction, you have about two or three issues, depending upon whatever issues that you have out there. So you've now finished treating one. So you go and take another one. And as I said, you make it a subheading by either writing it in capital or underlining it so that it will stand out. And uh, everyone reading your answer will know that this is the particular issue that you are addressing. Because sometimes when you are marking examination script, it's a bit worrying or disheartening when you read the introduction. The student has marvelously you know, formulated all the issues which the marking scheme, for example, uh, anticipates. And you start reading the answer and you are waiting to find out when two other issues which have been uh, highlighted or which have been raised in the introduction are going to be uh, you know, treated and you never find it. And that is very worrying. So to avoid uh, putting, uh, you know, in, avoid, you know, in order to avoid putting your uh, examiners or markers in such uh, uh, suspense, which may never be resolved, uh, make sure that when you are dealing with an issue, you let it stand out as a subheading, right? By underlining it or by writing it in capital so that it's there. And another point we also uh, share with you uh, is that all cases, right? Anytime you cite a case, anytime you cite a case or you incite uh, what we call the, a, a constitutional or statutory provision, please, I will encourage you to underline it, okay? I will encourage you to underline it. And don't ask me why. Uh, if you underline it, very important. Your scripts are being graded by so many examiners, okay? They are working under different pressures. Uh, if you underline your authorities, if the your marker, for example, uh, is tempted to just read Harry through your answer and just form a global impression. When he or she uh, sees that certain authorities are standing out in the sense that you've underlined them and the marking scheme that he's using, those authorities are there. It will actually detain him to engage your script the more. And you want what you've written to be given adequate consideration. And it all depends upon how you have also presented your answer. So don't uh, treat some of these things we are saying very light, okay? As I said, uh, having the knowledge on the particular question is one thing and presenting your answer in the most effective way is also another thing. And all these things are important in going to determine the performance that you achieve in the particular question. Good. So uh, when uh, you have actually uh, finished that particular, uh, uh, you know, that particular issue and all the issues as you have discussed, I mean, we have uh, discussed, uh, you need to draw your big conclusion, okay? You need to draw your big conclusion. The big conclusion in the sense that oftentimes, the question taskmaster will say that advise the parties or advise a particular party who may be mentioned according to the question. Or the question may simply say that identify the bigger issues and resolve them. So when you have finished discussing all the issues, you need to draw a conclusion. And then the conclusion will 
serve a number of purposes depending upon the type of the question tax master. If the question, for example, asks you to advise, let's say, the parties. Now, having done all the individual analysis of the issues, the facts, and the law, what are you telling the parties? Because in real life, the party is not, in, and the parties are not interested in all the legal things that you are doing. What they are interested in is that whether he has a case against someone or someone has a case against him. So the conclusion, you should be able to uh, prefer such an advice. And if maybe certain, uh, for example, remedies, especially when it comes maybe like the contract or tort or something, if, for example, there's even a particular remedy which is uh, relevant uh, as part of the advice, you have to uh, provide uh, that. So let us keep uh, that in mind. And as I indicated, that uh, you don't need to actually be writing uh, issue principle application and you know, conclusion against uh, each particular issue, no. So you have introduction, of course that one will come. And then you have like the, over there, as I said, the area of law, the issues, you outline them. And then you come and take the issues one after the other as a subheading, you underline them. And under each of them, you state the, the, the relevant rules in a command style or in a proposition form, accompanied by the relevant authority, be it a constitutional provision, a surgery provision or the case law. And then I also said that you have to state like the general principle and then if there's any exception, you state that. Now, when you are done and under that, you do the application, application and analysis. That is, you go into the facts, the relevant aspect of the facts in relation to that issue. And then you demonstrate whether the relevant you know, portion of the facts actually satisfy the requirement of the principle that you have stated. And you draw a conclusion on that. And if there is any supporting uh, case uh, in which, for example, similar set of facts and then a particular conclusion that you have drawn was also drawn by the court in that case, you could cite that and briefly uh, tell us about that. And as I said, you repeat that for all the issues. And then when you finish, you come and draw your big conclusion, pulling everything together and doing what the examiner said you should do. So in a, a nutshell, uh, that is uh, what is uh, required of us in uh, using the IRAC or ARAC or IPAC or APAC to answer a problem-based question. So in, in, in terms of how the answer appears, right, the layout, not necessarily the merit of what the student did. Uh, so some years ago, this is uh, what uh, one, one student somewhere. So this is how the answer uh, you know, appears, the layout. That's what I'm interested in, but not necessarily like the merit. So like the introduction, you know, the person said the issue is going to be discussed as follows, then started outlining them. Whether or not Ubeles Limited, building a 50-foot tower, conceal a breach of contract. We have stated that the issue should be in the form of a question. And here you can see that that is satisfied. Then the person has another issue. Whether or not vital assistance is entitled to reinstatement costs, diminishing in value or loss of amenity. That is another issue in the form of like question. And then uh, the third issue is also there. Whether or not vital assistance should pay the remainder of the 7,000 of the contract price and so on. Now look at the layout again. Now after the issues in the introduction, the person can to take one issue, okay? And make it the subheading that we indicated. So here that we see that the person has actually made a standard that this is the issue that he or she is discussing. And the person attempts to state the, the, you know, the rules or the law. And you notice that the person did not even write the, 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 the rule you know, there before stating it. After the issue, the person will just start. A breach of contract occurs when one party to a contract fails to precisely perform their assigned obligation or terms that form uh, uh, all, all part of the contract. As I said, I'm not interested in the merit of the person's response, but just like the, how the answer would appears, like the layout. 
Now, this was, uh, you know, the person uh, cited the case of the Robinson and Wood and Harmon. And then uh, he, the person uh, went on to state another uh, aspect. A court will certainly uh, accept that the failure to provide the required height. So now, of course, the, if we look at it, uh, having stated the principle, he or she started, you know, uh, trying to do the application. And then as she did the application, uh, where there is an authority which is not relevant, uh, he or she attempts well, to do that. So if you look at the, and then when he or she finishes, look at it, under that issue, he or she provided a certain conclusion. Only under that issue, vital assistance is therefore entitled to pursue a claim in damages for breach of contract against Obelis Limited. And the court will seek to award compensation to put him in the position who have been, had the contract be performed. So here, the person has drawn conclusion on that issue. And then he or she moves on to another issue. Look at the next issue. Whether or not Vitas has the entitled to reinstatement costs, so on. And then underneath, he or she will state the relevant principles of law together with the authorities, like as we see over there. Okay, of course, uh, don't be worried about the quotation of the exact uh, wording from the case because as you can see, this was an assignment. This is not like a examination room situation. Nobody expect you to be a working encyclopedia to have exact quotation of uh, the words of judges uh, all in your mind so that you have to state them exactly like, no, in examination situation, you're only required to para paraphrase like the principle in a way which will let everyone reading it understand it. So let's uh, pay attention to that. Yeah, so here to see that uh, uh, the person will do the application, conclude on it, and then move on to next issue. Okay, look at the other issue. And when the person has finished, he or she draws, if you like, uh, the big conclusion, like bringing uh, everything uh, together. And then the advice, which he or she, look at it, is therefore submitted that Obelis Limited has been to sue since there has been substantial performance on his part. However, his liable in damages for his partial non-performance the contract. Vitas as it will be well advised to pay the remainder of the 7,000 of contractual price, but should bring a cross-action or counterclaim for the inaccuracy of the completed work. So here, you see that the person has drawn the bigger conclusion. But in the particular question that they did, apart from advising the parties, the examiner followed it up with some other question and said that, is there any information that you require to give more certain advice? And then the person uh, went on to do this. And then there was another question who says that, will your answer be different if writers as they had in the meantime brought in new builders? So, what I'm trying to suggest to you is that where you have a problem-based question and you ask to advise the parties and after that, there are other follow-up questions. Don't ignore the follow-up questions, but deal with the, you know, the main issues in the traditional way that you have discussed first. And then when you finish, you now also address the follow-up question seriatim. That is in the order that the examiner has actually you know, posed them. Good. Now, this is a second sample in terms of a layout. That is how the answer appeared. Now, this person was using the ARAC. That is the area of law issues, rules, the application, the conclusion. So you see that in the introduction, as we have indicated, uh, he or she actually uh, talks about the area of law and then follow it up immediately with the issue, as I said it should actually stand out in the form of like an outline. And here too, you notice that he or she took each issue as a heading, look at it. And underneath, he or she stated like the principles. Okay, let's uh, just, uh, just read uh, one for example. Uh, but of course, as I said, the, the merit is not really what I'm trying to demonstrate to you, but, how the answer actually uh, appears. 
uh, that is uh, what is important. So under each issue, uh, he or she draws conclusion and then take another issue and go on and on until he or she got to like the last, uh, what do you call it, the, the conclusion. So uh, that is how uh, effectively the uh, Iraq is supposed to be used in order to make sure that you have a, a structured response and you're able to get all the marks which are allocated in the marking scheme for uh, the various aspects. Uh, okay, somebody has a question. Oh, sorry. I think someone has asked a question uh, in the chat. Let's see what he or she said before we finish. Uh, Doc, please, in case I'm lagging behind time, can I consider writing cases in capitals to make them stand out? Okay, now the person who asked that question, if you say you are lagging behind time, so you are just going to state, just list the cases. Of course, if you have five minutes to end, you know, and you, you think that you cannot write responses, but you know the relevant authorities, and then you want to list them, that is fine, but it will not uh, get you all the marks. Just you get the token credit, right? Especially so if you have uh, stated the authorities, which the marking scheme is uh, looking out for. Then the, another person has a question. Please, what do you think about the view of some lawyers or lectures to use the Iraq area of law, expository essay, issues, rules, principle, analysis, application, conclusion, and parents' advice? Uh, I think the simple approach, right? The simple approach is what we have discussed, and it is very common and acceptable to uh, a lot of you know, scholars and examiners. And it's also consistent with how judgments are even written. You see, the, the person who has the question, the expository uh, essay you are talking about, uh, problem, resolving problem-based question is not writing an essay, okay? So there's no point in you do the area of law in the introduction, and then you spend a lot of time trying to provide a mini exposition on the particular area of law before you go on to identify the issues. When under each of the issues, you also have to state the relevant principles, okay? So if you, you, you did that, you actually be wasting time and space because if you go to the relevant issue, you are going to state the law over there. So whatever you call like the expository essay as part of the introduction will somewhat be taken care of under statement of the rules or the principle under the particular issue you are discussing. Yeah, so that is my uh, answer to that particular question. And another person also said that, uh, uh, how, what are some of the pointers to differentiate between a criminal law problem-based question from thought-based uh, question, problem-based question? Okay, uh, that is a very, uh, uh, you know, I wouldn't say, the, all the questions are useful. That's a very, uh, you know, legitimate question to actually uh, ask, especially those who are writing the entrance examination. Uh, just as I said, one paper, but it's supposed to be testing, uh, says possible subject areas. So if you have a problem-based question, and how can you be sure whether what is asking you is a thought or is a criminal law? Good. Uh, my suggestion will be that once you read the problem, uh, assuming you are tempted to look at this as criminal law, the particular offense that you have in mind, ask yourself in terms of the ingredients, right? The elements for the particular offense. If you look at the facts, 
do you have uh, information to enable you to actually make a case as to whether those particular offenses are the offenses which are contemplated? On the other hand, if it's also like the thought, you definitely have certain thoughts in mind. And then you also ask yourself, based upon the elements, okay, of that thought uh, that you have, I, I, mean, I mean, that you know, having regard to the question, do you have enough information for you to make out whether those elements are satisfied or not? Now, some examiners have observed that some years ago, uh, some of the candidates decided to play safe, playing safe in the sense that uh, if you look at the uh, you know, the question, the person was not sure whether it was criminal law or thought. So he or she decided to actually address it uh, both ways. So that if the examiner is uh, testing uh, thoughts, he or she falls within. On the other hand, if it's about criminal law, he or she also falls within. Of course, uh, that having regard to the type of exams you're doing, that is the Ghana School of Law and Trans Examination, uh, it, it is wise to do what that particular student did, especially so uh, when the question uh, you know, does not come out clearly. And admittedly, if we look at some of the past questions, you know, they don't really uh, oftentimes uh, come out clearly, not all the time though. So if you did that, uh, I think you'll be playing uh, safe. But all in all, some people also say that if you are asked to discuss whether uh, what the liability of the person. Now, I wouldn't like anybody to say that simply using uh, you know, the word liability suggests that it is criminal law or is tort law. No, I think that would be... Uh, uh, inappropriate uh, way of looking at it because liability, we have civil liability, we have a criminal liability. Okay, but of course, if the question says that discuss any civil liability, then you know that criminal law has been uh, ruled out. So let us uh, keep that in mind. Okay, so I have a few minutes to go and do some other things. So let me look at some of the questions here. Uh, please, how the medium is a good script with all the principle, but less cases. That is what is your recommended average for scripts, especially constitutional law. Okay, uh, good. Uh, if you have like, uh, you, like you, uh, somebody saying that if there's a good uh, script in terms of the candidate having written uh, a lot of, you know, good ideas, but he or she uh, has probably not uh, stated enough cases, and you may see only one case or something like that. Uh, will such a script get good marks? And then the person also wants to find out what is the recommended average in terms of uh, uh, you no know, cases, especially if it's a constitutional law. That's what the person is asking. Well, uh, I will suggest that being a law paper, it will be sad if you wrote all the ideas without any authority. That one, we have to try and avoid it. And if I say authority, we know hierarchy of legal norms, constitutional provision, statutory provision, and then case law. So we read your answer, You've written a lot of stuff. You've not made any effort to let us know that the things that you are saying, for example, a money from the constitution, a money from a, a certain provision of a certain statute, or certain cases, uh, you 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 will get some marks, but the marks you get will be low. Uh, and there are certain subject areas. Okay, let me be clear on this. If you are doing something in the area of, uh, let's say, uh, contract, tort, right? If you are doing things in the area of contract and tort, for example, and you write your answer 
no matter how brilliant the answer is, if you don't cite case, your examiners will be angry and you get very low marks. The reason being that these subjects are what we call like the typical common law uh, subjects and common law subjects, the principle are located in the cases. So let's keep that in mind. But for constitutional law, uh, there are times that constitutional provisions will be what is needed. Another time that if that particular constitutional provision has been tested, maybe in the Supreme Court decision, then you will get more marks. If in addition to the constitutional provision cited, you are also able to uh, cite you know, the, the cases. But in constitutional law, if you cite only the cases and you don't cite the relevant uh, constitutional provision, it's also no good because the cases are not superior to the constitutional provision. The cases are supposed to illuminate, that they shed uh, more light or illustrate how those provisions are actually play out in practice and so on. So let's keep that in mind. And then somebody said, uh, when applying legislation, is it necessary to state the session, subsession, example, criminal offenses, uh, session 81, subsection two, or just session 81? Okay, uh, that is another uh, good question. Usually, when it comes to statement of authorities, the preference is that if your memory is very reliable and you can trust it, and you can state the authority vividly as your memory will permit accurately, that is to be welcomed and applauded. On the other hand, where you are not so sure that if you are to be very exact, maybe session 81, subsection 2, or session 46, subsection 3 of Act 29, or whatever, if you are not very sure that your memory is accurate, then I will play safe and go for the, the parent uh, reference. That is, if it's session 46, I just say session 46. It doesn't matter that we have subsection 2, paragraph. A and so paragraph II. That is where the particular thing I need to support my answer is coming from. I'm not going to take the risk and be that specific for fear that I may get it wrong. But if I just said section 46, the, it will satisfy the requirement of the marking scheme. Then somebody has a question uh, How many authorities will you advise for a problem question? Well, the authority, my answer is that. They may at, at the barest minimum, when you take any issue and you state the relevant you know, rule or the principle, each relevant principle or rule must be accompanied by authority. Because otherwise, you ask the question where did you get the relevant rules from? The relevant rules are supposed to be extracted from authority. So at that stage, you are required to state authority, but when it comes to the application and the analysis, even if you don't have any you know, direct authority to support that, it's not that uh, dangerous, okay? Of course, if there is, uh, you know it, that is fine, but if you don't, that is fine. Yeah, so that is what I will say. Okay, so thank you very much. And another time, my time permits, we'll meet again. <laughs>